What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Pod Scum. I am, of course, your host, your bastard of ceremonies, Reckless Rex Ruger. That is, of course, my quiet, silent partner, the Freddie Mercury puppet. His teeth are out, and he's excited, and I'm excited. We got another great episode. I am, of course, Diamond David Lee Roth Jr., and the hard science will prove it very soon that you're looking at the son of glam, the front man for the band, adored by a million fans, the peanut butter to your jam, Mr. Wap Bop, Blue Bop, Wap Bam Bam, Shazam, hot damn. Even caught a frog in my throat, and I still sounded great. And more importantly, I'm looking great. And that matters more than anything. We got another great one. Of course, this is where all the cool kids come to chop it up with your boy, Rex Ruger. Today is no different. We got another great episode. We're going to get down to it right now because our guest is here. Let's get down to the brass hacks, kids. Let's do it. Tom, what's up, buddy? I, now, exactly when you come on here, what is it exactly that you're the, uh, uh, that you're chuckling at, Tom? Is it the David Lee Roth hair? Uh, it's that technology actually fucking works. It's the technology. Yeah, that, that's uh, yeah, that, that's always good because uh, you, you know, and this is something you can certainly go brag about in your little circle, man. But you know, I, I well, the hard science hasn't proved it yet, but I'm on my way to proving that I am Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. I think you can tell, right? I mean. I believe it. Okay. You know? Okay. I may quote you on that. <laughs> I may quote you on that, and you also might be subpoenaed. Uh, uh, you know when it's well, you know when we get to that point. I plead the fifth. I'm going to put you on record as saying that that hey, when I looked at him, I saw Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. You're a I man mean, of taste. You know, it's uh, it's probably the hair. It is the hair. the hair. It is the hair. And by the way, man, I think there's something to be said for good, heavy, thick. Uh, 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 riff, uh, induced music, man, and facial hair. Uh, you, you yourself have a tremendous beard. It's yeah, it's a little, it's a little wild right now. I haven't trimmed it in a while. But when it's I think of great hair. beards, I think of heavy music. Like I think Kirk from Crowbar. You know, what I mean, like I just think these awesome, amazing yeah. beards, man. And you always, and you always seem to find that uh, uh, that heavy music is made by uh, well, not always made, man, but a lot of times, amazing facial hairs involved. Well, you know what it is? Laziness. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know it's mine will get a lot longer, like as the winter time comes. I'm in upstate New York, so we are about to probably start heading slowly into our cold months. And then, I, yeah, I, I stop giving a fuck as much, too. It's just, uh, you know, I guess a buddy of mine put it to me like this. He's like, you know, you can tell who's focusing on their riffs and not on their facial hair because yeah, they just yeah. don't grow. Yeah. It sounds right, like good. Right, like if you're busy trimming facial hair, man, uh, uh, you know the music is being uh, neglected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and yep. and I want to get down to the music, man, because uh, uh, um, am I led to believe that this band, uh, uh, Twenty Watt Tombstone, only operates on two guys? How do you get such a mm -hmm. thick sound, man? Is there a bass player? Are you playing the bass? Is there bass at all? Uh, well, I will answer that. Uh with a bit of an explanation, I guess. So okay. when we started out, um, the band started out as basically a joke and I didn't really take it that seriously. I was just playing through a normal guitar rig and uh, playing how I normally do with a drummer. And uh, the more we did it, the more it started to be taken seriously and we had to kind of uh, stop treating it as a joke and start actually kind of preparing. Right. So we recorded a record, uh, started the tour and um, live, we just were not able to replicate the sounds of a bass through a normal guitar rig. So that led to some experimentation, which, you know, led to different amps, different guitars. And I finally settled on the, uh, the Gretz that I play now because it had a lot of bite, but it also had a lot of low end because it was semi chambered. And then, uh, the guy that works on all my guitar gear um, was like, well, you should try bigger cabs. You should, you should try more power, uh, pushing, you know, more volume, but focusing on lower tones like a bass amp would be. 
So I tried a couple bass amps coupled with guitar. I didn't really like how that sounded. And a couple guys were already doing that already. So I just kind of felt like I needed to find my own voice, sort of. Yeah. Um, so I relied more on the playing of the notes than the tricks to kind of fill in the, right. the holes. And basically kind of went back to more rootsy uh, styles of like almost Delta Blues stuff where they're playing open chords and using their fingers to pick root notes and that sort of thing. Right. Um, and then I just kind of stopped thinking like a guitar player and started thinking like a bass player and walked away from things like solos and that sort of thing to focus more on rhythms and filling in the holes. And uh, so it's been kind of a, it's been kind of a sonic journey, I guess, trying to, trying to make it sound that way. So after, you know, 14 years, I think we finally nailed it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, me not being a musician myself, I couldn't really tell because you do have it, you, you know, you do have the sound, you know, layered in such a way that because there's so much fuzz and thick riffs and distortion or whatever, uh, it, it all kind of bleeds together and uh, you really camouflage it quite well. I mean, it's not like a blatant, like, you know, we're going to turn off Jason Newstead's bass on injustice for all. I mean, mm -hmm. you not hear any bass at all. You know, I, that's why I had to ask. I'm led to believe that I'm here hearing bass on there which i guess is is a good thing for you well on on the latest record uh the producer wanted us to layer the guitar so yeah. normally how we've done it for years was we go in the studio we play it live and we're done um but we worked with you know a different kind of engineer this time we worked with an actual producer um and that kind of changed how we were forced to think with the recording process. So uh, what you're hearing on the new record, there is no bass guitar, but what you are hearing is you're hearing my guitar rig layered twice. Okay. So there is, on this new record, there is an actual rhythm track. But uh, the thing is, like, we wanted it to stay true to the live show because we didn't want people to hear, like, solos and bass and all this other stuff and then show up to a show and see the two of us and we can't recreate it. Right. Like we wanted to take liberties, but we didn't want to push them so far that the live show was a completely different animal. Right. Um, so, so yeah, there is there is a rhythm guitar on the record, but it's the exact same thing that I'm playing. Otherwise, it's just layered twice. So, so, uh, um, so, uh, have you tried? Have Have you actually, uh, you know, tried to recruit bass players, or is this deliberate? You know, have you guys just said, "Look, we want to just do this as a duo, uh, and 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 do what we're doing." Mm -hmm. So, you know, so there's been no search for a bass player, or you know, any kind of an no. idea to say, "Hey, let's add a third guy to this." No, um, and that's a question I get asked a lot. Uh, we have had multiple offers from bass players, but the uh the thing is we we want we want this to be one of those things where there there is a certain kind of dynamic there we yeah. want the air there so like in the places where you hear air it's kind of like a jackson pollock painting like it's sloppy as hell it's all over the place but we know where everything is all of right. those placements are planned so um you know i <laughs> i always joke around uh about this but the usually the people that ask us why we don't have a bass player are bass players <laughs> yeah <laughs> and they usually follow it they usually follow it with oh yeah how about me <laughs> yeah so yeah. uh we have had offers and some people are very surprised that we don't want one uh but the thing is from you know from a music standpoint it allows us to have some air you know, around the notes we're playing. It allows some space for us to fill how we want. And uh, I like being able to have people come up to me at a show and say things like what you said, you know, where they're like, how the hell do you do that with two guys? Like, that's yeah. very flattering. To me yeah. Because I've put a lot of work into the guitar rig and the tone and the way we play to fill those holes. So when people, you know, if you, and besides, if you can do it with two guys, it's less it's less people to feed on the road yeah why add another yeah, right why add another pain in the ass to the mix <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> who needs a third member for god's sakes i mean it's hard enough just yeah. to keep you know because a band very much is i'm starting to realize just talking to so many musicians on here that you know 
it is a dynamic, you know, I mean, like, and complicated, like, or, like a relationship, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, like, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, it is like a marriage, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, you've got egos, you've got personalities, you've got personality quirks, you've got all these, you know, you got all, all these mm -hmm. moving parts in place. And it probably isn't easy to necessarily keep a bunch of guys all on the same page. Well, yeah, that's for sure. Um, and the thing is, like, you know, I'm, I'm 48 now, and I've been doing this band for 14 years uh, come February. Yeah. So it's uh, it's one of those things where we've been at this so long that we are starting to see bands break up and new bands start. You yeah. Know? And it, yeah. It really gives you some perspective about how long bands last. You know, yeah, because there are there are some bands that we know that were around before we started and they're still going. That that definitely is a thing. Um, but we have seen a lot of bands that we know uh, all over the country who, uh, you know, were our go to's for shows and be like, hey, you want to play with us in wherever. Um, but we've been a band long enough to see those those things come and go. Um, and I think one of the reasons we've been able to do that is because there's only two of us um now uh my regular drummer that i've had with me for years um during covid lockdowns him and his lady um had a baby so now his life is a little more complicated than it used to be and he can't go out like he used to so i'm actually uh touring with a different drummer now for the time being and uh i'll tell you what if if i had that problem on a on a bigger scale like if i had a four-piece band and you know like a couple guys had stuff going on like it would be the end of the band most likely oh yeah you know yeah so i think one reason we've been able to do this so long is we only have two people so if you know if one guy can't do it you know it's fairly easy to you know keep going if you can get a fill-in which is yeah kind of what we're doing. now you guys are based in wisconsin correct Yep. Now, yep. Lost all Wisconsin. Now, I had a guy last night on here, man, uh, uh, who uh, came from Ohio, uh, Iowa, and I tried to quiz him on other musicians from Iowa. He had nothing except for Slipknot. So, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> so in, in terms of your area, uh, uh, who else? Uh, who, uh, you know, do you know your Wisconsin music history? Who else has come out of Wisconsin? You know, that the music world would know. Oh boy, uh, Les Paul, probably the biggest one. Okay. Violent Femmes. Final oh yes, from Wisconsin. Um, the Guffs. I don't know if you remember them. They were kind of big in the '90s for a while. Um, uh, what's the? There's another one. There's another big one. I'm forgetting. Uh, Weezer. Bony, I don't think they're from here. No, maybe not. The, I think the. I think the band that did the. Maybe it was the Friends song. Is from here. The I can't Rembrandts. Remember. I think maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so I'd say I say I so I'd say out of that whole list, man, I would probably call maybe the violent femmes love you you're probably the name that most people would probably recognize the most. Yeah. Yeah, violent femmes, uh Boney Vare. I don't know if you know who he is, but he actually lives in uh Eau Claire. He's uh he's like a solo singer song. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, people he's, love that dude. Yeah, he had he had a song like in the the Twilight soundtrack and like yeah. crazy shit like that. Um, but he's you know, he's he's another big one. Corey Chisel is another one that's from Wisconsin that's kind of big. Um well, you're way ahead of my you know, dude, man. You're way ahead of my guest last night, man. He had nothing. He had nothing to offer up for Iowa, man. He, <laughs> he, he, I, he went exactly where I knew he was gonna go. He went right to Slipknot, and after that he had nothing. I mean, I don't know. I'm plugged the fuck in, man. I I've been doing this yeah, for a I long time. You have to so. be. Yeah, and I've lived all over, and I've toured all over. You know, so I've I'm constantly learning new things, and I've actually learned some things about my state that I didn't know uh, being on the road from other people. So, um, yeah, I I don't know. I I just try to be try to be open to what's happening around me. <laughs> Now to go back in time, man, and chop it up about your beginning, man. When you started getting, uh, you, you, you know, like when you got bit by the music bug and 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 started to follow it, you know, uh, you know, uh, your musical journey. Was there a specific artist 
or an album or a song that really kind of sparked it for you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we were talking about uh, Van Halen earlier. Van Halen is kind of what got me into music. When I was a little kid, I saw the Hot for Teacher video uh, where Eddie is the little kid and he's playing on the on the yeah. tables and shit. I don't know what it was, but that was the coolest music video I had ever seen in my life. And yeah. and I wasn't allowed to have uh, like MTV or anything. So I saw that shit at a friend's house. I had to sneak that shit. Why weren't you allowed? Strict parents? Uh, I had very strict parents. Yeah. My uh, my parents were very religious and Mine I grew too. up way out in the country. Uh, cable wasn't even a thing where I lived. Like it hadn't yeah. been like yeah. Like you couldn't do it even if you had the money. Like it kind of sounds like uh, our trajectory is kind of the same. I had strict religious parents too, man, and they were really up my ass, man, about like music for some reason, or yeah. like just like things like you know, like you know, you know, entering into my world, man, that were from the entertainment uh, industry. You know, what I mean, like they were always trying to like monitor and like you know, what I mean, like you know. Oh, you know, this might have a certain influence on you. This might have a certain, you know what I mean? Like, this doesn't mm -hmm. seem right to be listening to, you know what I mean? And of course, I wanted to explore the heaviest shit that I could find, which certainly was not going to be, uh, you, you know, get their approval. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of how it was for me, too. Like, I, I had a very strict upbringing, lots of church, uh, wasn't allowed to play anything but classical guitar when I was a kid. When I yeah. wanted lessons, they were like, okay, you can take lessons, but you got to learn nylon string classical which was boring and yeah. what kid wants to play that i mean you know there are kids out there i'm sure that want to learn it but like you know i i had this this hunger for you know music that wasn't being fed to me so i was getting little pieces of it from school and you know i'd see friends with shirts that said like acdc and ozzy and i'd have no idea what these bands sounded like yeah and didn't have the internet so you couldn't, you know, you couldn't just look up a band and be sneaky and listen to it. Right. So I I actually was explaining to my son not too long ago how uh, he was. Well, he was he was telling me that he didn't think Kiss was evil. And I'm like, well, now, of course not. Like right. you had the family jewels and all this other stuff. Like, right. The mystery of rock and roll is gone. Oh, yeah. Could, Without a doubt. We have, we have access to too much. So like. When I was a kid, you had basically what you heard from your friends. You know, you had, you know, uh, Metal Edge magazine and, you know, Rolling Stone and some of the, you know, some of the heavier magazines were geared towards metal and you got like some of the shit there. But basically it was all hearsay. It was all hearsay. It was MTV. It was magazines. And you got fed little tiny pieces about these people that you idolized. Right. So, like, right. you'd see a picture and have a couple quotes. You didn't know what their political leanings were. You didn't know that they got arrested in 92 for, right. you know, prost prostitutes or drugs or whatever. Like, you just got these little pieces. So, rock and roll still had this mystery to it. You yeah. Know? Like, Kiss was not Kiss as it exists today. Gene Simmons was not the guy that you see on the Family Jewels. He was the demon. Right. He was spitting blood and he was wearing makeup. And you didn't know what he looked like. You just knew that this guy was spitting blood all over the place and your parents fucking hated it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You know? so it was like it had this whole rebellious feel. Like Motley Crue, same thing. Like the Motley Crue that exists today, you know, I have to kind of laugh at them for what they've become. But like, you know, the first two or three records, you know, you just saw these pictures of these guys that pissed your parents off. Yeah. And they were singing songs about fucking and drinking and all this stuff that you weren't allowed to do as a kid. So right. there was this whole rebellious nature that existed, this whole, you know, Iron Maiden and Ozzy and all that stuff. You, you got fed these little pieces and uh, it just made rock and roll so much more interesting and rebellious. And, uh, you know, so when I would go to school, I would borrow tapes from kids who had these type of bands uh, and I would take them home and I would copy them on a blank cassette and my mom wouldn't find them that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's how I kind of got, you know, fed little bits of, 
of music here and there was, you know, going to high school and getting these little tiny tastes of what I was missing. And I couldn't fully embrace it because of, you know, the way my parents were at the time. But uh, I was able to see that I didn't want to learn nylon string guitar. I wanted to learn like, you know, Angus Young and, you know, yeah, that kind of stuff. So. Well, I've had many guys on here from like extreme metal bands too. You know what I mean? Thrash and even heavier like death metal bands. And I, I get your point about the, uh, about the magazines because it always seemed like uh, those death metal guys would be in the same pose. They'd be taking a picture somewhere out in a wooded area with hair in front of their face and you'd be like, <laughs> wow. And, you know, and then yeah. you'd listen to the music and you would literally think these guys must be the scariest motherfuckers on the face of the earth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, it, you know, it, it, it didn't seem like at all that they would be like approachable, man. You know what I mean? Like the look like went with what you were hearing on there and and it was kind of nice that you didn't know everything about them you know yeah i i, I mean I, I just remember i just remember seeing pictures of glenn benton from deicide and i thought wow this guy's got an upside down cross burned into his fucking forehead man these guys are fucking out there living it man holy shit this is scary yeah yeah it's uh you know it's uh it it allowed more of a separation of art from the artist yeah because you were getting the music you were not getting this flood of all this other information and in some ways that's good like it's good that we know certain things about certain bands it's good that we you know when something bad goes down if there's racism or you know right. somebody rapes a girl or something those are things we need to know in society yeah. so we can separate those people but there are other things you know that color the way that we listen to music you know and i'm guilty of this too i'll you know i'll listen to a band and i'll like what they're doing and then i'll see the bands they're touring with or i'll see some quotes from them i'll see what they look like and it right. changes everything you know uh my son was a pretty extreme uh metal kid most of his teen years yeah uh, the heavier the better eight string guitars and no singing just straight up a wall of noise yeah yeah, yeah. that's his yeah. thing so uh <laughs> he really liked this one band and i can't remember who it was but he googled them and he found pictures of them and they were all like skinny short-haired kids in, in skinny jeans with no tattoos yeah and he's like ugh. yeah this is disappointing <laughs> and he didn't like them after that and that's yeah. a perfect example is it's like if you like the music you like the music but we're yeah. swayed by all this other information we have access to yeah and some of that we can't help as human beings it's just you know we are who we are inside and certain things are going to change how we feel about stuff because of who we are but uh you know there's something to be said for back in the day not knowing anything about something just hearing it on vinyl for the first yeah. time in your headphones reading the lyrics off of a you know off of a vinyl sleeve that's something that kids today can't experience like we did because you know they can listen to vinyl they can read the lyrics but we were forced to that's what yeah. we had that's yeah. all we had yeah you know so we couldn't google the lyrics we couldn't do any of that if we wanted to read lyrics we had to hope they were printed in the record and there was something to be said for being alone with that record when you first got it, having your headphones on and having to focus on the record rather than listen on Spotify while you're driving or whatever. Right. Music wasn't as convenient. So right. You had to take time for it, which I kind of miss. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I could rant on all that stuff forever. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that music has changed and how we intake music has changed. and. Uh, you know, that's a good thing and a bad thing. I'm glad in the last couple of minutes that both Motley Crue and Kiss have popped up in this conversation. I'm interested to get your take as a fan of music. You know what I mean? If you lay down your hard-earned money and you go see and, and take these two bands, for instance, because they've caught a lot of flack the last couple of years, and it seems like nowadays everybody is going to shows and they're whipping out their cell phone, not so much to maybe uh, document the moment, but almost to play like armchair music critic and catch people like pulling shenanigans. Now, uh, now, uh, do you have a problem? Like if a band uses these, and again, I'm not a musician, these smoke and mirror type tricks, backing tracks, you, you know, I don't know all the ins and outs and the terms or whatever, but would you rather go see a band 
and and know that they're doing that? Or are you okay with seeing a band kind of warts and all? You know, I mean, okay, I, I came away from the show. They didn't sound all that great, but it was fucking authentic. That's a tough question because I think it goes into an area where some bands, uh, you know, some bands just can't do what they do anymore. Right. And if they're gouging people for tickets, I have a problem with that because yeah. you should never take advantage of your audience. Your audience are who got you there in the first place and they're yeah. who keeps you continuing to do what you do. So I feel like there needs to be some respect for the people who've gotten you there. And I think we as musicians at a certain point in our life have to put our selfishness aside and decide if we can give them what they need to get, you know, because Motley Crue is not going to play on a $25 ticket. They're just not going to do it. They're too much right. money. Right. Uh, you know, and yeah, and, you know, but yeah, when I go to see them, I have no idea. You know, I feel like I'm duped too, man. Like, I, you know, I took the wife to see them last year and then you read all this stuff like, you know, oh, you know, Nikki six hasn't touched his bass in years. He's not playing anything up there. It's all fucking recorded. And, and you, know, uh, you know, as a layman, that's not in the business or a musician. You know, what I mean, you're watching it and you have no fucking idea. You think you're seeing the authentic. I mean, I, you know, I realize as bands get older, it's 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 an it's kind of a, a, a you know a, a lazy comparison to try to chastise somebody for not being able to replicate what they did 30 or 40 years ago mm -hmm. i get that and i think but i think i'd feel better if maybe kiss put the caveat on there that look you know what i mean you're gonna get the pyro you're gonna get the fire you're gonna get gene you know dripping the blood off his tongue it's a performance but we might be using some shit to bolster the performance a little bit you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's almost like almost like kind of going to see like a, a like a broadway play at this point you know well, and I think with bands like that, there definitely is that factor. Um, the other thing, though, and this goes back to people filming shows with phones and whatever, um, you know, if if it's art, it's pretentious for the artist to tell anybody else how to take that art in. Right. Because if if we're creating art, we don't want someone telling us how to create it. We shouldn't be telling other people how to take it in. So if somebody's out there with a phone, I mean, I I get, you know, like Randy Blythe has said that, you know, the energy isn't there. And I agree with that. Like you have a much more energetic crowd when they are not filming and they're in the moment. Yeah. yeah. But this is this is the world we live in, you yep. know, and, you know, I don't want to be the old guy who's like, oh, cell phones are bad. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like me personally, what I like at a show. I like to watch the show and maybe get some video just to remember the show by, but I'm not going to film the whole thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. but the thing is, that's how I choose to take in the art that I'm seeing. And I don't feel like any artist has the right to tell people who are taking that art in how they should do it. Just like right. they shouldn't tell us how to create it. Art's subjective. Yeah. Very. Now, at, and speaking of uh, of of uh, you know art, you know, what I mean, apparently from what I read, and uh, you know, this is always interesting. I don't know like how you feel about genres or like the labeling of of a certain band. Like you know, it seems like the metal world or the rock world, everybody they want everybody to seemingly fit in this neat little box. And there's so many genres and subgenres and subgenres. Uh, uh, so I, I have heard you describe uh, the the term that I've seen I've seen come up the most is death blues. <laughs> Yeah, which is a new uh, one to me, uh, and, and a very interesting genre. I mean, if someone says, "Hey, do you want to listen to some death blues?" I'm going to admit, man, I'm fucking in. I'm all in. We we actually didn't come up with that. Um, Freddie J from Left Lane Cruiser uh, coined that phrase one day, just out of the blue. And yeah. with our with our earlier stuff, it fit a lot better. Now the band kind of evolves from record to record. And, you know, like I said, we've been a band for for 14 years. So the sound has changed. Like what we originally set out to be and what we are now is a very different thing. Um, so I don't feel like the Death Blues thing accurately describes what we're doing now. But I feel like it accurately described us for many years because it was heavy blues uh, riffs. And we had, you know occasionally we used uh you know like death metal screams as backup vocals 
Yeah. So you can kind of hear on some of the older stuff, the backup vocals are just straight up like guttural yells. Um, so that's kind of where I think that that name came from. And and he, when he when he said that, I thought it was genius and it worked really great for us and got a lot of people interested in the music. Um, but when when people ask me now what we are now, uh, I usually just say it's straight up rock and roll. Yeah. God damn it! You can't just be straight up rock and roll anymore. Is that even a, <laughs> is that even a is that even a genre anymore? <laughs> the fans just yeah. won't have it. <laughs> yeah, everybody always wants to, you know, to call you something. You know, it's yeah. like they feel this need to make you different. And yeah, uh, you know, I guess I just, uh, you know, over COVID, the stuff that I was writing was you know, kind of coming from a different place than it had in the past. And I was listening to a lot of, you know, Rival Sons and Black Sabbath, um, you know, Goodbye June, stuff like that. So I was listening to a lot of just basically rootsy rock and roll. Yeah. And uh, the guy, well, one of my best friends uh, helped us produce this new record and helped me wrote, write two of the songs off of it. And uh, he was from Lafayette, Louisiana, and had played in multiple rock bands and, uh, you know, was kind of a bluesy, psychedelic rock guy himself. So that all kind of mashed up into a, a big ball of what we couldn't really describe as anything but just plain old rock and roll. So we decided not to fight it and just call it what we thought it was. And now, who is this guy? Are you able to shout him out? Uh, you know, who is this guy that's helping you write songs in Louisiana? Uh, well, he actually passed away in uh, in March of this year. Oh. Um, but his, his name was uh, Brother Deej, and he was in a band called Santeria back in the 90s for a while. Okay. But uh, he had a song in uh, Django Unchained a few years back that blew up and got a Grammy nomination. Yeah, and uh, so his career kind of took off, and uh, but uh, but yeah, so he's he's a great songwriter and a great arranger. So having him, you know, help us out with not only the producing of the record but writing two of the songs with me was a huge huge deal. And uh, you know, I feel like I feel like this record. Mix wise is the best thing we've ever done, but I feel like the songwriting is much, much more mature than the other two records too. So, and I think and we owe that to him. And aside from the death blues, I will also quote: I don't know if this came from your website, and and uh, and Bandcamp took it, or if Bandcamp uh, 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 kind of came up with this. But uh, you were also described as uh, uh, fusing ZZ Top and Caius by way of Robert Johnson and Black Flag. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's all over the map right there, that. Tom. That's all over the map. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> our uh, our marketing guy took some stuff from our original press kit and wrote up the bio that I use in most places now. And he yeah. uh, he put that together. And the thing is, like, that's that's very true. Like, that that kind of sums up our sound a lot better than, than most yeah. comparisons I've heard. But and I like that there's, I like that there's a punk band in there too. That there's a punk element to it too, though, because you got to have that yeah. punk rock attitude and swagger in, in somewhere in the mix. You know, a little, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, irreverence. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the thing is, blues music has a lot more. True blues music has a lot more in common with punk music than people give it credit for. It's. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you go back to like the Robert Johnsons, the, you know, Sun House, Book of White, like those kind of guys, uh, they were, you know, as rebellious as it as it can get. You know, yeah. it's metal as fuck. You know, they're singing songs about the devil and Jesus and cheating and lying and drinking whiskey yeah. and murder. And there's this brutal honesty to the music where it's like you don't question these guys. You know that what they're saying is true. And I feel like that brutal honesty is kind of something that you see in a lot of the, the great punk rock bands like Black Flag and Minor Threat, you know, yeah. and, 
you know, and go back even further to Stooges and the MC5. Like these are these are honest, rebellious rock and roll bands that are pissed off at the world. Yeah. And, you know, couldn't really find their place at the time. So they were angry. And I think that is kind of what a lot of those blues guys were going through, too. They couldn't really they couldn't really find mainstream success. They were ignored by major labels because of the color of their skin. And uh, they were kind of forced to be off on their own doing this crazy blues thing. So when you and uh, uh, your drummer is Mitch, correct? Yep. So when you guys get together and you're going to create music, uh, what's the creative process typically typically like? Like I know you said you guys get together and actually play, you know, uh, w- w- which is a, an amazing way to go about the, the the creative process. But in terms of like writing the stuff, are you the main songwriter? Is it collaborative? Is it a democratic process? Are you both pitching in ideas, or does somebody usually come with the lion's share of the ideas? Usually, what happens is I write pretty much everything then we go into the rehearsal space and we fit the puzzle pieces where they need to go okay you know and then uh drum parts are written guitar parts are written but most of the time i'll write the skeletal idea of a song and then we go hash it out together and you know sometimes that will entail me writing a drum part uh and I'll be like, hey, I really want you to play this this way. Uh, and then naturally, you know, he tries to make it his own and add some things. So it's not like I come in with a finished song. Like, this is how it has to be start to finish. Right. We kind of let we let the the natural things that are going to happen, happen, see where it's going to go, see what we like, see what we don't like. But, yeah, for the most part, um, I write all the lyrics. I write all the music. The only exception to that is uh, on this newer record. Um, I wrote two songs with Deej, who I was talking about a minute ago. Um, he wrote the lyrics for the uh, the title track, uh, The Chosen Few, and then he wrote the lyrics for Bomb That Saved the Day. And then that's the a song I love. Record. I got to admit, that's oh, my really? favorite one. Yeah, that's one of my favorite ones on there. It is. Yeah, yeah. I really, I, yeah, I, I, I was really grooving to that song uh, today on my lunch break at work, man. I was trying to go through it and like really kind of, uh, you know, really do my homework and kind of absorb the album. You know, I mean, when I had some downtime and some quiet time and and, and to just try to kind of like mark down some of the songs, it really, really stood out to me. And and, and I, I'm curious, is is it deliberate? Because with uh, with Wisco Disco and this album, they were both, uh, uh, you know, at seven songs. And they were all, you know, they were both almost like, almost like, I know they're full length albums, but they're almost EP, uh, you know, type of length, 25 to 35 minutes. Uh, is that deliberate? Because I know that around COVID time, especially a lot of singles, a lot of EPs. Uh, I, you know, I think it's almost like people felt like they were almost going to be forgotten about. And it was kind of like survival of the fittest and they couldn't go out and tour, obviously, around that time. You know, and uh, plus, obviously, there's you couple that with the, uh, the, the the general public's dwindling attention span i I don't know is there a right answer for you how long an album should be um for us a big part of the reason that we do shorter records is we we want vinyl vinyl is huge for us it's one of our biggest sellers and our our crowd um doesn't really buy cds they buy vinyl so uh vinyl is always the priority like when we make a record we write it with the intention of putting it on vinyl and um now that i know a lot more about the science behind vinyl um my goal is always to make a record that's you know where there's enough value there that it is a record like i don't want to short change people and give them three songs and put it right you know but uh I want to keep the records relatively short so we can get the absolute best mix possible on vinyl. And with vinyl, uh, when you get too long of a record, uh, you either have to cut it on two records um, or you can you can try to fit it on a record, but your volume is going to suffer. Your quality of the record is going to suffer uh, yeah. in the mix. So we always try to because the thing is, like with a double record, yes, we could do that. But like, I don't know, it's a lot of money to press vinyl. And it just, for me, all of my favorite records are like one record, you know? So I always want to try and fit it on one record if we can. 
that's not to say we won't do a longer record than seven songs at some point um but like i also believe in kind of going project to project you know right and with this record we had three more songs but i just didn't they didn't fit they didn't fit the the theme of the record they didn't really feel like they belonged um and when i ran them past deej since he was the producer he's like these are good songs but he's like they don't feel like they work for this record yeah uh and that was exactly what i thought too they felt like the the odd stepchildren that just didn't yeah. really yeah. Fit in, you know? <laughs> and uh so you know and and they also two of them felt like they needed more work they felt like they were unfinished and i mean technically they were finished they were finished songs but something about them just didn't feel as done so um so i just made the call i was like you know i want this record to be good i don't want there to be any shitty songs on it at least from my perspective and uh those three were just kind of I, I didn't really know what to think about them they weren't 100 percent. the other ones were all 100 percent with me i loved every single one of them i knew i wanted them on the record but those were just kind of whatever so i was like you know what don't put anything on this record you're unsure of you right know? so i left those off they might they might come back at some point they might get you know nothing might get done with them i don't know but i felt like what we had had a flow to it and i wanted to keep that flow the way that it was and uh Deej actually, when he, you know, he helped me come up with the whole, you know, order of the record. And that's something he's always been amazing at is order of his records. Um, but like, I had kind of a vague idea of how I wanted it to, you know, to play out. But I had the two covers last. Right. And he was like, no, nah, man, you can't close your record with two covers. Can't do that. Yeah, he's like, you got to have this flow, this build, and then he's like, I think Magnolia is the one you got to close with. He goes, that's a closing song, and I'm really glad we went that route because I feel like the flow of the record is much, much better now with that as the closer. But, uh, but yeah, so long, long answer there. But I think in a lot of ways, though, man, I think in a lot of ways, you know, it's like you used to hear the term in music. Oh, this is a concept album. This is a concept album. But I think when you really think about an album, though, you know, they're almost all conceptual in nature because, you know, you talk about the arranging or whatever, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I everything is so deliberate on an album that you are really meant to. And you made a good point before, like where you didn't have all these distractions. You had to go in and just like be, you, you know, what I mean, at one like with this album and play it all the way through. You know, what I mean, I, it, mm -hmm. it, it it seems like that's the way they are meant to it. And now in this day and age, people go around and they pick and choose. Oh, I like track one. I like track nine. And that's all I want to listen to. You know what I mean? And I mean, you couldn't imagine like putting on like, a, a, like I use this one as an example a lot. You wouldn't like put Pink Floyd the wall on and not go for the whole ride. You wouldn't just be like, oh, I like track two and, 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 and eight. You know what I mean? And, I, and yep. you know. And, and I'm not going to explore these deeper tracks because they're the ones that really help, you know, kind of, you, you know, tell the whole story. Mm hmm People don't do so, that anymore. And how many times have you listened to a record where you thought, man, that's a weird order for those songs, or that was right. a weird song to put first? Yeah. And I think we don't think about that as much until we hear something that doesn't make sense. And then we go, whoa, right. that's a weird, you know. But yeah. like uh, sometimes having a weird arrangement works really well. Like, you know, in the 80s with a lot of the metal stuff, you always had the mellow instrumental thing at the beginning, and that was yeah. the intro. And then yeah. you had the fucking banger, yeah. grandma puncher that just came out yeah. and, just, you know, and then a couple songs in, you know, first side, third song, maybe you'd have a ballad, a power ballad, yeah. you know, but there was a, there was a formula that was working and it was yeah. working for a reason, yeah. you know, but, uh, but I agree. I think uh, I think certain albums just have this this flow that we take for granted until we hear the song by itself, and we're like, "Well, that doesn't work right without right. this." 
Master of Puppets is a good example of that. Yeah. Master of Puppets flows so well from beautifully. To yeah, it's got all those the elements that you. Talk, it's got all those elements you talked about. You know, kind of battery kind of lures us in with a little bit of you know mm -hmm. beautiful guitar playing at the beginning, and then yeah, then it comes in, and then it comes in for the jugular. Yeah. Yep. It's a it's a great example of a well thought out order for a record. Like yeah. whenever people tell me that, I think of like you said, Pink Floyd, The Wall. That's yep. another one. Yeah, the order on that record is fantastic. Master of Puppets is another one. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of great records that we just, you know, kind of take the order for granted because they're they're so ingrained in us. But when you stop and think about how brilliant some of these records are and how they were plotted out song by song, um, it really it adds to the experience. And yeah, it makes the record better. You got to Yeah. You got to put like the, uh, you, you, you know, the concept of arranging has got to be one of those things that uh, it probably gets, uh, 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 you know, overlooked a lot, man. But it, yeah, almost essential to an album. Mm -hmm. I mean, great songs obviously goes without saying. Where do you stand on touring right now? You said you've been doing this for a long time. Uh, you also mentioned you're 48 years old. I, I'm 51. I mean, I'm not a musician. I go to a day job every day, but I know at 51 years old. I like my creature comforts. I'm kind of a homebody at this, this this stage of my life. You know, did you still like the nomadic existence of kind of going out on tour and you know saying goodbye to the family and everything and being out there on the road? Uh, and and uh, you know, second part of that is you know, uh, what's a, a comfortable itinerary for you? Like, how long do you like to go out for? That is a big question. Um, probably the easiest way to answer it is uh, for a lot of. A lot of people like me, um, it's not really, it's not really a choice, you know. Um, like a lot of, a lot of what I call lifers um, do this because we have to, you know. Right. It's kind of the, it's it's the, it's the thing that keeps us sane, you know. Right. You can say that. Um, but like you know, artists in general are are crazy you know yeah the, yeah uh, the, the better you know the better the art the crazier the artist that's that's generally how it goes and crazy people uh are about the only people that are gonna go out on the road and give up the comforts of home you know yeah. so i mean i think people like me we do it because we have to but we also love more than just the music part like the whole the whole grind of of the road is kind of what yeah. what keeps us coming back it's kind of like you know i've joked around with friends it's kind of like that that shitty mistress that just won't yeah won't give up on you yeah and you just yeah. Can't say no yeah but yeah uh, you know because for a lot of people it's it it's the thing keeping us alive but it's also the thing that's killing us you know, and that's why you see so much, you know, addiction and mental illness and suicide with a lot of artists is because, um, you know, we're just we're wired differently. And yep. to do what we do, uh, you know, requires feeling things pretty deeply. That's how that's how art works. Yeah. So um, so as much as I love being on the road. Um, you know, it's it's a challenge sometimes. And at 48, my goals have changed quite a bit. Now, um, you know, 2017, I was doing 200 and some plus shows a year. Right. Uh, you know, I wasn't married. And, uh, you know, it was hard on my relationship at the time. It was hard on my kid. It was hard on me. I was drinking all the time. I, I got so bad at one point. I came home and couldn't sleep in my bed because I hadn't slept in a bed and, like, months yeah so i i had to sleep in the van because i couldn't sleep in my own house and uh that was kind of a point where my girlfriend now wife uh was like something's got to change like this isn't healthy yeah. you know so it, it's one of those things where it's like over the years if you can if you can control it it can be good but the problem is the road just gets you further and further away from reality and it becomes you know you come home to your life and your life is 
you know, here and everything's kind of like a slap in the face, like bills are here. Your girlfriend's mad at you. Your mom isn't speaking to you. You know, you're right. You got you got court for, you know, custody court for your kid. Um, you know, you got child support. You got all these things. And it's like your world changes. And those things are still important, but you get further and further away from them. And, you know, if you're not prepared for it, um, it can just detach you from reality. Yeah. To the no, point yeah, where you're now. just not thinking like a normal person. So um, for me now at 48, um, I'm averaging about 100... 115 125 shows a year and that's yeah. pretty comfortable the yeah. band's making better money now so i can afford to play less uh and then what i do is i just i do solo shows when i'm at home to kind of keep the bills paid yeah but tours are really where i'm i'm making the most money and then merch obviously but um but for me now like i couldn't i couldn't do what i did you know 10 years ago like i right. just couldn't do it the the grueling show after show after show um you know works when you're out there in it all the time but the rest of your life is being neglected because you're out too much and we were going out more than just about any bands i knew like the bands that i knew that really hit it hard were starting to say to us man you guys are hitting it hard and yeah I thought that was a compliment i was yeah. like well hell yeah yeah. You know, like the guys in Mothership were telling me that they were seeing us everywhere. You know, the guys in Whiskey Dick were telling us they saw us everywhere. Like we had these bands that I really respected who played all the time, you know, telling me that they thought it was cool that I was playing all the time. And, uh, you know, it it was cool for a while. But, you know, it's hard on your body. It's hard on your relationships. It's hard on the mind. And uh, at this point in my life, I'm good with like, you know, being on the road, maybe a hundred shows a year. Yeah. And I think that's plenty. Now, so what's the, uh, 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 so uh, you, you mentioned like the solo stuff. So you, uh, you're referencing like the Reverend Mean Tooth stuff, right? So, mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, is that just something that you do uh, as kind of a departure from the band or you just need to kind of go in a different creative, uh, you know, direction or, you know, like what's the impetus uh, behind doing something solo? Um, well, originally it was just a money thing. It was yeah. just something to do close to home, stay close to home, play acoustic shows. And, uh, when COVID happened and then my drummer had a baby, I was kind of forced to think a little more <laughs> seriously about it. And, uh, so then I was like, well, I got to make merch and I got to release some music because if, if I can't play, if I can't tour with him, uh, right. you know, I'm going to have to do something more than just go play, you know, acoustic blues covers. So that was kind of the motive. And then I just started releasing kind of singles and doing merch. And uh, a buddy of mine had always joked around and called me Reverend Mean Tooth because uh, I used to be in a band called Mean Tooth Grin, so he would always call me Mean Tooth Tom or Reverend Mean Tooth. Right. So, and I was like, man, my name sucks. I don't want to use my name. <laughs> so you so have not I, been, uh, 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 so breaking news, you're here on my show to announce that there has been no official ordainment. You are in no way, shape, or form an actual reverend. I am actually a reverend. Me too. I've got my ordainment card, and I've done uh, up to this point. I've I performed two wedding ceremonies, but so far Thanks. my divorce rate is at zero. Both couples are still together, so I'm, I, I you know, I awesome. must have some, I must have some type of mojo. I married my son and his wife, and then I married a a, a coworker and her husband, and and. Uh, uh, Otherwise, I don't really know like what I used the ordainment card for. A couple of times I used it for good clergy parking at the hospital because I felt that I was entitled <laughs> to that. But that's about it up to this point. I, but I do like to call myself. And the site that I went through allowed you to pick, uh, 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 you know, sort of different like uh, uh, prefixes to go before your name. And I chose Reverend. It sounded like the least, uh, uh, 
I, I don't know. Some of them were just crazy. I'm not going to call myself an apostle or a messiah oh. or some of these. Some of these. I mean, some of these ones were just a little bit too out there, man. You know, obviously the one they wouldn't let you pick is father because that actually just you know you do actually, yeah. actually have to be, be, be a, an actual Catholic priest. But they had pastor, minister, preacher. You know, what I mean, they had all these ones in there. But at least reverend sounded like it had some kind of uh, nobility to it, but didn't sound yeah. so pretentious as to call yourself an apostle or a messiah or. Oh. Man, I'd have taken the apostle. <laughs> I'd have just called myself the apostle. And now, what just was your and what was the impetus for you behind getting uh, an ordainment? Did you do it like an online thing, or did you actually go to like some type of a Bible college? Uh, well, I did go to a Bible college, but okay. not to get ordained. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I'll give you a short backstory okay. here. So, when I was uh, when I was younger, my parents wanted me to be a preacher. That was the whole plan. Like I was going to be a preacher. Um, so I was enrolled in a Christian college and preaching school uh, before I graduated. And uh, that was always the plan. But I got to college and realized that I didn't think that I was comfortable telling other people yeah. how to live you didn't life. you didn't truly have the calling <laughs> well and a lot of people still think that i should be a preacher including one of my my best friend on the planet still tells me he's like you would have been an amazing preacher yeah and he might be right but i have sort of a weird love hate relationship with religion i uh when i Originally, I dropped out of college, decided I didn't want to be a preacher. Um, and I had taken, you know, I had taken courses at the Christian college. And uh, a few years later, I decided I wanted to go to a secular college and do religious study. So it was a vastly different education, vastly different. Yeah. Uh, there were There was a whole lot of uh a whole lot more explaining of things rather than just saying well you have faith that's how they yeah. answered everything at the college i was at they were just like well we have faith and i'm like well i have questions like yeah absolutely yeah so and i and i don't fault anyone uh for having faith for not having faith i think faith is an amazing thing if it brings if it brings good to your life i'm absolutely for it uh but my problem is that it brings hate and uh, judgy attitudes to some people's lives. And I'm not down with that at all. But uh, but yeah, so long story short, excuse me, long story short, uh, I was supposed to be a preacher and uh, I am three credits away from a bachelor's degree in theology. Boy, that makes my little online ordainment sure feel small. <laughs> All I had to do was pay 20 bucks to get a card in the mail. But I mean, uh, uh, but so, uh, uh, but so to answer that question, or I mean, uh, you know, to kind of follow that up or whatever, uh, what specifically was the denomination that you were raised at, or if you don't mind me asking, or like where you would have ended up? Yeah, I, I mean, you, you know, did you have a, a, a particular, uh, you know, discipline that you were, you know, or, or you know, uh, a specific, I guess it would be denomination. So the, the church that I belonged to, um, well, that my parents belonged to um, was non-denominational, so they didn't uh, they didn't believe in any sort of denominations. They just right. They had they had very specific beliefs that were very very conservative. Um, I would I would say they weren't quite snake handlers. Yeah. Yes. But they were. <laughs> <laughs> they were a couple steps below snake yeah. handlers. So yeah, there was no speaking in tongues. There was no snakes, but it was it was very uh very conservative. Um no instruments in church were allowed. You you were a cappella, that's it. Um yeah. their their idea was that, you know, that instruments would be against God's will. So there were no instruments. So that's another reason why guitar for me kind of got pushed to the background because 
my parents kind of thought that uh, it was unnecessary. You know, if it wasn't being used for church or to learn how to be a preacher, it wasn't really important. So I try to save uh, 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 these last uh, couple of questions for the end of the interview. Sometimes people have to really kind of mull on them a little bit. Sometimes they roll the answers right out. For you, your Mount Rushmore of all-time acts. Obviously, this is subjective. You, you know, for you, your Mount Rushmore, your four, uh, your four goats, if you will. Uh, uh, for, you know, f for your musical taste. Oh boy, that is a tough question. I listen to so many different types of music. Um, but I would say mine's going to be weird. I'm going to okay. be real weird. That's uh, good. Prince, for sure. 100%. I love him. <laughs> he's my favorite He's Prince. my favorite artist of all time, and I am a hard rock slash heavy metal kind of guy, man, but I, 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 he's always been my guy. I love him. I'm going to say Prince, um, Lemmy, because, yeah. I mean, the, the two things that I've listened to with the most consistency through through my entire life are Prince and Motorhead. Yeah, you know, I, I have moments of my childhood where it's tied to Prince. It's tied to, you know, right. Motorhead. So right. those two for sure. Um, I'm going to say Muddy Waters, you know. Oh, I love that. I, I love that. Yeah. The guy invented rock and roll, you know, I mean. He took the sounds of the Delta and put them on electric guitar and yeah, changed the world. And uh, and then I'm probably going to say Waylon Jennings. Oh, I like that. I like that. Well, well yeah. I, I mean, that does stay pretty consistent with, uh, you know, uh, this genre of music that you, uh, I don't know if you invented it or whatever, but the whole death blues thing or whatever, man, I, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that, uh, that vernacular slapped on a lot of other bands. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that makes sense, man. All those picks kind of make sense. You know what I mean? It, you know, you fuse them all together and I could see like, you know, your sound being born from, from, from having those, uh, those four uh, artists that you named as influences. I it really, sense. I listen to so much stuff. I listen to everything except for pop country. I think pop country is just, the most yeah. garbage music there well, is. Well, it's hard nowadays because it seems like, at, you know, every kid from the suburbs that throws a cowboy head on is now suddenly country now, you know what I mean? It, or, it, and this crossover stuff, it's just confusing to me. Like, I, I, I'm i with yeah. you. Like, if I'm going to listen to country, I kind of like those old outlaw guys. I, I feel like yeah. they'd be rolling over in their graves if they could see what's passing for country nowadays, you know? And I, it, it, admittedly, yeah. it isn't my number one genre that I, you know, it isn't my go-to country music, but if I get the urge to want to listen to some, I'm usually going to be going back to, as you said, your Waylands, your Johnny Cashes, you know what I mean? Like your stuff of yeah. that nature, you know, it's just, you know, all this stuff now just seems like watered down and like you can hear it on a country channel, but you could also hear it on a pop music channel if you're listening to the radio. So that's not country to me. Yeah. And it's, you know, to me, the message goes against what like, yeah, guys like Chris Christopherson and yeah. Willie Nelson and Waylon did, you know, like, they they were they were rebelling against the music system they were not they were not playing along they were not pandering and a lot of this pop country stuff is yeah it's marketing that's i think that's why i don't like it because for me i can respect any music if the art is there it's when right. the art isn't there and i don't feel the art that i lose respect for it and it's you know, I'm I'm man enough to admit there's a lot of stuff that I don't like that's not my thing. And right. When I listen to it, I go, that's not my thing, but I respect the art that went into it. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff like that. Um, right. But there is some stuff that I listen to, and there's a formula. You know, they're just trying to rehash this formula of this thing that they think sells. And right. you just picture some label guy counting his money. Oh, we made yeah. another million yeah. of these yeah. foolish yeah. people like we got them again kind of stuff, <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff doesn't do anything for me and i don't feel anything when i listen to it and yeah that's not to say that all art is going to make me feel something but i you know as an artist i can see when the art is there i can tell when it's there and when it's not there it just feels like you know like like a marshmallow like there's nothing there to it there's no right you know no consistency and uh that's really where i kind of draw the line but for me the, the mount rushmore thing is so hard because there's so many people that i 
I look up to and respect, you know. Yeah. It, it's just really hard, you know, to pick. I do kind of fuck people over with that question. And I don't even know if it was posed to me if I could properly answer it either, <laughs> man, because my tastes are always changing too, man. But I don't meet a lot of people, man, uh, you know what I mean, who've got the hair, who've got the beard, who make the kind of music that you do. And I, and I talk to so many hard rock and metal guys on here. I'm intrigued, though, man. I don't hear... I think a lot of musicians have respect for him, man, but he's not shouted out on the Mount Rushmore or shouted out, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the guys that I talk to, you know, uh, 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 but, but what was it for you about Prince? I'll tell you for me growing up and loving hard rock and heavy metal though, Prince would just seem like one of those guys were like, even though all my friends were into hard rock and heavy metal too, he was kind of like that guy that we could all say that we liked and kind of get a pass and not feel like we we're getting our, our, our heavy metal card pulled from us. You know what I mean? He, he was that guy that, and I think unfairly, a lot of people just think like, God, didn't he just dance and make a lot of pop songs? I don't think people really understand like how yeah. powerful a musician and, 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 and just the balls on the guy at 17 years old. You know I mean? He goes into a studio and they want the guy from earth, wind and fire to produce his first album. And he says, Nope, I'm fucking doing everything myself. You know what I mean? I'm playing everything on this. I'm producing it myself. And just to stand for all the things that he stood for, you know what I mean? He got into that mm -hmm. point where, you know, people thought he was a little weird when he's writing slave on his face, but it was all like anti-contractual stuff. He, he felt like, you know, the music business was kind of, you know, you know, dragging him, you know, dragging him uh, through the muck, so to speak. You know what I mean? I, I love what he stood for. And then like when you see him at that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame performance, which is now legendary, where he's playing while my guitar yeah. gently weeps and he's up there with Tom Petty and Jeff Lynn and Steve Winwood and George Harrison's son. And you can tell that their jaws are all on the floor too, man, watching him shred this solo. But I believe he's the only one up on that stage that could have actually done that solo. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yeah. I, I mean, for me, I kind of put him up there as just like a special once in a lifetime talent. I mean, you know, a, a guy that can sing and dance and play, you know, dozens of instruments proficiently and write his own stuff and produce his own stuff. You know, I, I know through the eighties, there was that whole like war of like him versus Michael Jackson and no disrespect to Michael Jackson fans, but I mean, it kind of stopped with, for Michael Jackson at the singing and dancing. I mean, you know, people in the, in the big Motown machine were writing his songs for him. You know, Prince was always honest and doing his own material. I mean, for me, he's just a cut above everybody else in the pop rock world. So, and I think his ability to be different. Yeah. Know, that's always been a big one. But like, you know, like you were saying, how he lived and how he was honest and kind of you got the real him all the time. Yeah. That's one thing that I was really into. But the biggest thing for me is that there is no artist that I can think of in the history of music who has been able to do whatever the hell they want from record to record. Yeah. And still be relevant. Like, yeah. That's really impressive. Like you look at bands that have tried to do different stuff and sure Prince has some records where it's like, Oh, you got creative there. Maybe it wasn't as good right. as selling records. But the right. thing is when Prince died, he was still fucking Prince. Yeah. And he still had the name. He hadn't gone anywhere. Like he was right. still as relevant as he was, you know, when he came on the scene, like that's, Really, what's always amazed me is like this guy could come out and go, I'm going to make a rock record. And yeah. Make a rock record. And it would sell. Yeah. You know? Um, and there are artists who I think kind of emulate that a little bit. You know, like Sturgill Simpson is another one that I really admire for that same yeah. thing. I think he does whatever the hell he wants. And it's awesome every time he's able to just be himself. Um, I love that he made a psychedelic rock record. That was fucking yeah. great. I love that yeah. record. Yeah. But uh, but the big thing for me with Prince is that he could do so many different things and do them well. And just every record, you were just kind of like, okay, let's see what he did this time. Um, but the other thing, too, is, like you said, he could play all the instruments and play them really well. I saw a yeah. video not too long ago of him doing the bass tracks for... Uh, one of the songs on the Batman soundtrack. And he's sitting in the studio on a chair doing all this like crazy, like slap bass stuff, like Victor Wooten style, like really yeah. good bass playing. Yeah. And, uh, and he's just destroying it. Yeah. <laughs> like he's kicking ass big time. And the thing yeah. is like, this is a guy that could play bass like that on par with some of the greatest bass players ever. 
hardly ever did it live once in a while he played bass but like most of the right. time it was just on studio recordings yeah. he apparently had the passion to play guitar and sing and also fucking ripped on guitar uh but was also tasteful you know and he was a good or you know good arranger like the way he arranged songs was was awesome yeah he was a great producer. Like he had all these skills. He was just kind of an alien. Like he was super good at everything. You know. I get that. I get that. I get what you're saying there because I've even had a couple people on who have been like you know in his vicinity. Uh, like a uh, like a uh, I think last year I interviewed uh the drummer from the Fun Loving Criminals and he said that he was even you know he got to meet him uh, after a show once and it's almost like even when you're within a couple of feet of him and I kind of got this when he said it he almost gives off this otherworldly vibe man like you kind of know there's like an aura around him where you kind of sense mm -hmm. like okay you know I'm around something special here you know yeah. It it really really was, and uh, it just you know I hate to use the word, but there there was something magical about what that yeah. guy did because yeah. it was so unique. There was no one else that has ever done the things that that man has done, you know. Yeah. And like I said, being able to stay relevant as long as he did, and be making records that sell is pretty impressive i mean yeah you look at any any rock band or any, anybody for that matter and it's really hard to find people that have managed to stay consistent throughout right their right right you start to listen to stuff and it kind of starts to sound antiquated a little bit and you start to say like mm -hmm. you know this is not as fresh as they once sounded you know yeah prince did not have the phase yeah. where he was playing casinos Right, 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 and I think that he, and I think that he always stayed cutting edge, uh, you know, in terms of like you know fashion and like knowing the you know knowing like the latest cool things to do, like when you're dancing and everything. You know, you look at Michael Jackson; he was still like moonwalking and doing that crotch grab. You know, what I mean, like well into his career and 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 still kind of leaning on some of that old stuff. And you didn't get that sense. You always felt like okay, you know, if Prince went out to the club, you feel like okay, man, this guy would know what all the cool dances are right now. You know, what I mean, like you know, he always seemed yeah. to have his ear to the pavement. He would know what's cool. Right Right now in the fashion world or what's going on here and there and, and and as you said like be relevant in all those areas too you know well there were also and this is another thing that we can thank the internet for there was no kind of that i know of anyway there was no kind of big scandal involving prince which a lot of our 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 musical heroes if you want to call them that uh a lot of them have weird skeletons in the closet weird shit they did or yeah. maybe they didn't do that we'll never know but i mean you know with michael jackson you got that whole debacle oh, yeah. that unfolded with yeah. him and we'll yep. never know what happened but it looks not great you right know? so but i mean that's another thing is like to go as long as prince did without having any kind of scandal yeah. or bullshit you know who else is another one uh is eddie van halen like you never hear oh yeah well eddie van halen blah 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 blah. like right there's not a whole lot of stories about him right doing anything bad right <laughs> you know? I, I think people I, I think people just know a lot about the drinking and the addiction but that's kind of yeah. par for the course with anybody that does music for as long as he did you know what i mean like yeah. you know there's always going to be there's go i seems like there's always going to be some traces of that and especially bands mm -hmm. that went through the 80s you know i mean yeah well, that was it seems very hard. It seems very hard to come out the other end of that and not have had like a few vices or like a few demons or skeletons in your closet. Well, and also it, going back to that whole thing of artists having fucked up brains and being, for lack of a better word, mentally ill. I mean, you put somebody who just wants to make art, you put them out there in the world in front of a bunch of hot screaming women or whatever right. and you give them access to everything that they've ever considered sure. wanting uh it's it's access to excess it's it's too much you know so there's there's a whole lot of that at play too and it's uh you know like like i said earlier you know you get out there long enough and it just life drifts away and yeah. you become the band guy Yep. And uh, so for Eddie to stay rooted like he was and be, you know, 
basically a decent person, everything that I know about him, uh, is pretty impressive. And Prince, same yeah. thing, you know. And I guess I respect that in a lot of musicians. If you can do this shit and come out the other side and not be a complete fucking asshole, I yeah. mean, that's a feather you. in your cap. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Now, 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 the, now, this one might even be tougher than the Mount Rushmore one. But if I'm dropping Tom Jordan on a desert island, what's the what's the one desert island album that he's taken with him? And again, because tough. me and you have ch- and, and, and again because me and you have chatted here now for over an hour, and it seems like I've been doing this on a lot of episodes lately. But I do genuinely like you, so I guess I'd let you pick an artist and take his whole discography. I guess, but I mean, you know, uh, 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 I guess of course you've got that. You, you know that 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 fucking album that's really special to you that you could i guess essentially you're going to be on this island and fucking die to this so this is a, i guess the soundtrack to your fucking uh what's left of your li- life on this island and ultimately your death so i guess choose wisely <laughs> yeah yeah so for, for me that record has changed this year i guess okay um my my friend that i told you about that i yep. co-wrote the new record with um, he released his last record a week after he took his life. Okay. And it is, uh, one of the hardest records for me to listen to because okay. when he was writing it, he was sending me demos for it and whatever. Um, but now with him gone, if, if I were stranded, that, that would be, that would be the one. So I would say brother Deej Aurora would be. Aurora is the name of the album. Okay. Yeah. And brother Deej, you spell that how? Uh, 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 brother, and how would you spell Deej? D e g e. D e g. I'm gonna check him out for sure, man. What kind of genre? If you had to pigeonhole his style of music, wh- 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 how would you classify what he does? Boy, he's hard. He's hard to nail down. Uh, he's got some records that are a little. They're a little more uh, psychedelic. Okay. Like blues rock. And then okay. he's got some that are just straight up singer songwriter stuff. Okay. But okay. Lyrically it's uh lyrically it's it's real dark melodic yeah. uh folk music inspired, I guess. Well, well I've realized as I've gotten older, man, like as I said earlier, man, well, you know, when I was younger, me and my friends were always, you know, it kind of starts with the eighties for lack of a better term, hair metal. But then as the 80s progressed and, uh, you know, me and my friends start to, you know, you start to dig, you start to say, wow, I want to find the next hardest thing, the next fastest thing, the next most brutal thing. You know what I mean? But now as I've gotten older, uh, uh, you know, hearing that stuff that like you described that your son is into, that wall of noise or whatever, you know what I mean? I, there was a point in time when I loved that too and was chasing that. But now as I get older, I, I've kind of found my lane and I do need some melody. I can't just do hard blast beats and just, you know, a wall of sound coming at me all the time. So I really think that I kind of slid into like, uh, uh, you know, a certain, and I guess call it doom or stoner metal or, you know, sludge or whatever. I was having this conversation with a guy the other day, uh, uh, Carl Agel, who, uh, uh, who, who who just made a great, he used to sing for Corrosion of Conformity, and now he's really big in the sludge, in the sludge uh, kind of doom stoner metal world, man. And he's in a band uh, now, a project he's doing called Lie Heavy. It's an incredible album. Oh, yeah. Very in the vein, yeah, very in the vein of what you do, man. And uh, I'm starting to realize, man, I think this is my lane. I like what he does. It's a, per, you know, it's yeah. still got the thick, sludgy, you know, uh, uh, heavy riffs. You know what I mean? Uh, and and it, it's it's heavy in a different way. I used to I used to equate heavy as being fast and brutal and incomprehensible lyrics and fast drumming and everything. But then you realize, man, that heavy can mean a totally different thing, though. Too, you know. He- heavy is a mood, man. It is heavy. Is uh, heavy is a feeling, and you can, you know, now that we're older we're identifying that heaviness in other ways right. that we at the time couldn't really pick right. out, but like a yeah. lyric can be heavy. Absolutely. Uh, chorus, yeah. you know, a, a person, you know, pouring their heart out can be, you know, heavier than any riff. So yeah. I think it's just that we're more in tune with that side of ourselves more so than we were when we were kids and we're able to hear heaviness in other avenues now. Yeah. 
So let me ask you now. Uh, 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 so the so so the last twenty watt Tombstone album, uh, the Chosen Few, came out in twenty twenty three. Uh, uh, any plans for anything new on the horizon, and what's the timetable on it? Uh, realistically, do you think you'll have something out uh, in sometime in twenty twenty five? The goal is to um, kind of let this album do its thing for a little bit. Okay. Um, I wasn't Basically. sure in today's musical world how fast people have to follow up stuff nowadays. You know what I mean? Because you see bands sometimes take five, six, seven, uh, uh, upwards of eight, you, you, you know. But then some of those bands don't really need to, man. Like Metallica can put an album out and then, they, you know, like they can wait seven years before mm -hmm. they put out like their next album or whatever. So, you know, I didn't know if you had a definitive idea in mind, like, you know, how fast, you know, how soon do we follow up what we've just done? Well, so the thing is, if this were just a normal record, and Deej hadn't been involved and hadn't, you know, died, uh, we probably would have been already working on the next one. But because he passed away, we want to make this record be all that it could be because it's the last thing that we have of him. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so we want it to be kind of an experience. So the plan is we've got a music video that we just wrapped up shooting. Um, we're going to drop that hopefully by the end of the year here. Um, but when Deej was alive, we came up with this concept about skateboarding and, you know, using it in the song, The Chosen Few. Because The Chosen Few, uh, originally when he shot me the lyrics, I thought it was kind of a political statement about not fitting into society, you right. know, or where the, the rich are and we're down here. Um, but after he took his life, I realized that that song might have been a much more personal statement about where he was at that time. Right. Um, but the idea of the song has always been not fitting in. So he and I had come up with an idea where skateboarding would be the backdrop of this music video. We play in a bowl and have skaters skating around, show tricks. Um, but ultimately, the idea was we wanted to show falls. We wanted to show people just standing on boards not necessarily everybody's amazing but everybody right. within this area is getting along and here everybody's the same yeah like here you're accepted doesn't matter what color your skin is doesn't matter i you love know, that who you love yeah. or whatever the idea yeah. was here in this place we're all cool and uh so that's the idea that we had well then he passed away and we never made the music video so now it's more important than ever that we get this music video out. So that's one project. And then we're going to um, try and put out another music video for Bomb That Saved the Day and do one for that and uh, kind of release them spread out. And then I'm going to uh, release a book that I'm writing. And then after the book is out, then we'll probably uh, be looking at releasing a new record but there's a whole there's a whole thing a whole group of things that need to happen first before the next record so and when you say book uh are you are you talking like a uh, like a memoir style book or like uh, or like a work of fiction <clears throat> well it's basically uh sort of a, a diary i guess of life on the road all the okay. goofy stupid shit that's happened to me Okay. Some of it's really cool. serious. Uh, some of it's really sad. Some of it's goofy and funny. Um, but it pretty much originally I started out writing it like a diary, like it was going to be May third, blah 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 yeah. blah. Today, yeah. Blah, blah, Captain's blah, blah. log. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's how it started out. But um, yeah, Deej wrote a book too called Cab Log, and it was about his experiences driving a cab in Louisiana when he was an out of work musician yeah. and his stories are, I can imagine. Yeah. I <laughs> can imagine. Like some, yeah. some of the shit in there is fucking gnarly, uh, yeah. but he had like a thousand pages and he edited it down to like 200 and it's still awesome. Yeah. But uh, he, he was just releasing his book and I said, yeah, you know, I got this book that I'm kind of sitting on. I, I don't know. It seems kind of stupid. I don't know if I'm going to do it. He's like, no, you should do it. So during 2020, when everything was shut down, he was finishing his book. I was kind of 
starting mine back up. And uh, then he kind of gave me some ideas on how to write it differently. So now it's become more of a story that doesn't have dates. It's just here's this story, here's this story, here's this story. Um, and it's written more like it's happening right now rather than last night, I blah, 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 blah. Right, so, right. So it's still, it, you know, it's still the same experiences. It's just told a little differently and it's not, it's not as linear, you know? Yeah. Well, listen, man, I, I'm glad we got a chance to actually do this, man. This has been a really fun conversation, man. Uh, I appreciate you being so generous with your time, man. Uh, for sure, keep in touch, man. I would definitely love to do this again sometime, man. Uh, and, you know, whenever you got something cooking and or something in the works, even when you fucking don't, whatever, you know? <laughs> Just like to get on here and chop it up, man. It's it, it, It's been fun, man. Yeah. Appreciate you having me. This was a good yeah, one. I really appreciate it, man. I love what you do, man. So, you know, I always like to have the artists on here, man. You know, I like to let them know, man, that I, I don't just draw your name out of a hat, man. I've stumbled across you in some way following the algorithm on my streaming platform or, you know, or, or I get bands suggested to me or whatever, man. And I can't remember when you came on my radar. It was quite a while back or whatever, man. But yeah, I love what you do, man. So it, it is reaching people out there. I think artists sometimes need to hear that sometimes because it is so daunting mm -hmm. right now to be, uh, be a musician. So it's nice to know that your stuff is kind of like, you know, it's getting in people's ears out there. It is, you know, regardless, of, regardless of, That's you know, cool. how big the masses are, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, everybody isn't Taylor Swift necessarily, thank God. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's reaching people though. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, there are people out there that are digging it, man. I, I dig what you do, man. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time, man. It's been great talking to you, Tom. Really appreciate it, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. Yep. We'll do this again. We'll do this again sometime down the road, man. And if if ever you need a musical collaboration in the vein of uh, adding a little bit of glam and you're looking for the pedigree of a Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. And, and you, cho <laughs> you choose to go you choose to go that direction and do a little something, you know, a little something different. Uh, I can't say that I have the pipes of uh, of the old man, but, you know. <laughs> I'm sure with all that layered, all that layered, distorted guitar, man, you could hide me somewhere in the mix. I think we could. Yeah, we'll make it work. Yeah. But it was great talking to you, Tom. I really appreciate it, man. Really, we keep in touch. We'll do it again, man. For sure. Thanks for all having right. me. Thanks, brother. Have a good one, my man. Thank you. You too. All right. Later. There he goes, folks. Tom Jordan from a band that I am going to, again, recommend and tell you that it's Rex Ruger approved. Go check out 20 Watt tombstone uh and then you will come back i am assured of this and say rex spot on again man i love what these guys do because i love what these guys do man again 20 watt tombstone the last album what came out last year 2023 it's called the chosen few uh seven songs uh around a half an hour man of just uh well as you heard me say death blues uh take that however you want man uh i read you the tagline uh or, or the uh, you know uh, 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 the marketing uh, you know phrasing that that they used in their press kit or whatever fusing ZZ Top and Caius uh, with the blues of Robert Johnson and the punk uh, attitude of, of a Black Flag uh, very cool very doomy very sludgy very stoner esque uh, a lot of uh, uh, psychedelic elements heavy thick fucking guitar riffs man. Uh, 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 if you like your music heavy and thick and sludgy and doomy and fucking heavy as fuck in a cool fucking way, go check out 20 Watt Tombstone, man. Uh, and uh, they have other albums out as well. Obviously, uh, go do your homework. Get on wherever you listen to music and go check out the entire discography of what they've done. I am just telling you that 2023's Chosen Few is the last uh, uh, piece of work that they put out, man. Uh, certainly worth checking out, though, man. And I uh, want to thank Tom Jordan for coming on here and chopping it up with me. That was a particularly fun episode, man. Uh, very insightful guy, man. Uh, and uh, uh, shared a lot about uh, what he does and the process behind what he does. And just a fucking thoroughly enlightening conversation. So I thank him, man. Uh, the Freddie Mercury puppet, again, added nothing to this episode. But when does he ever? Uh, uh, the day that he does will be the day that uh, I probably just walk out of here and let him take over the show. So we're not at that point yet. Thank God. But uh, Freddie had his teeth out. And again, he was strictly a mouthful of teeth. No pun intended, Freddie. Uh, added nothing to the show. But that's all right. Because me and Tom Jordan carried the fucking load and carried it admirably. Uh, the beards were out and the beards were in full effect, man. Tom's was uh, uh, particularly lush. Uh, 
couldn't help but comment compliment him on uh uh how how you know, lush for lack of a better word uh there was a plethora of beard there man and uh he wears it well man and uh it's about time that it's going to be winter time here in upstate new york i will have to uh again probably uh start adding some girth to mine as well to insulate the face i'm rambling here but thanks to tom jordan Go check out 20 Watt Tombstone and make sure to like and follow us on Facebook. And also make sure if you're watching this right now and you got your peepers feasted on me, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay tapped in. As you know, this is where the cool kids come right here to chop it up with your boy Rex Ruger. No place else. So stay tapped in, man. And like I always say when I end these fucking things, remember, kids, take it easy and keep it sleazy.